You're always looking for purple squirrels with uh, pink polka dots, right? That's our life, Jeff. You went from high school history teacher to going into recruiting. How the heck did you make that transition? You know, I don't think I've ever found a recruiter that has decided that they wanted to be a recruiter freshman year of college. Hey everybody, this is Jeff Widener with the Tank Scanning Experience Show. Welcome back. Today I've got a very special guest, and we've got Luke Doubler from Recruiter Central. Luke, welcome to the call. Thanks for having us on today, Jeff. Much appreciated. And, uh, why don't you give me a quick 30 seconds about Recruiter Central and what Luke is all about? You bet. Uh, founder of Recruiter Central. At Recruiter Central, we fill difficult jobs. We're a team of 12 located here in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Our clients range from Fortune 50 down to smaller businesses across the world. Uh, if you have a difficult to fill role, come to Recruiter Central and we'll certainly help you out. That sounds like fun stuff, man. Uh, you're always looking for purple squirrels with uh, pink polka dots, right? That's our life, Jeff. Is this what you've always kind of been doing in your recruiting career is always kind of filling those difficult to fill roles? We got the best job as recruiters. Uh, we change people's lives for a living, ideally for the better. So uh, recruiting is something I absolutely love. Uh, before I began Recruiter Central about five years ago, I was at Target, uh, Target, the big bullseye based out of Minneapolis, Minnesota is where we're based. I was a uh, leader on the executive recruiting team. Prior to that, I was uh, at Cargill. And then uh, I spent almost two years uh, right out of college as a high school history teacher. You went from high school history teacher to going into recruiting. How the heck did you make that transition? You know, I don't think I've ever found a recruiter that has decided that they wanted to be a recruiter freshman year of college. You know, yeah. most of us fall into the profession somehow. But what I do find is that most recruiters end up in recruiting because they're leveraging their strengths, uh, yeah. whether it be speaking, communication, partnering, collaboration. There's so many skill sets that can be emphasized as a recruiter. Uh, a lot of times it just takes a little bit of business experience and life experience to kind of figure out, yeah, recruiting is for me. That is absolutely the case. I have a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Photography and Graphic Design and Somehow I landed into this whole recruiting gig. So and it's kind of right. stuck for the last 25 years. I, I know that you kind of gave me a little few questions to ask and things like that. We're just going to, going to go off the cuff. But I mean, we've got the great resignation nation. You're seeing it all over LinkedIn and Facebook and up and down the news channels and things like that. Um, what are some of the hottest jobs in the marketplace right now that you're seeing? Yeah, I had hair before COVID, believe it or not. <laughs> um, and that's a lie. I didn't. Uh, <laughs> It's crazy. And you hear about it everywhere. You read about it everywhere, how the market has permanently changed. Uh, you know, before COVID, you were on site, you were putting in significant hours and um, you had fairly, uh, you know, even kill expectations across employers. Now things have changed dramatically. The employers that seem to be adapting the best, if I could generalize, would be, you know, technology or, or, or engineering companies, SaaS companies specifically, because they've been working relatively remote uh, prior to to COVID coming in the shutdown. And then the industries that are struggling the most are generally the ones that have been traditionally on site who really haven't gotten the whole work from home thing figured out yet, maybe don't have the technology in place or management expectations in place. Additionally, uh, it is certainly a candidate market unlike I've ever seen in my 20 years of professional experience. I'm 41 and I've been recruiting uh, for about 20 years. Uh, what we're seeing right companies now- Companies are in denial about that though? Well, I, I absolutely, absolutely do. And then um, you're seeing in reportings across all the publicly traded companies, you're hearing either directly or indirectly things like supply chain, you're hearing staffing. And really, it really boils down to they don't have the hands on they need to execute based on their, their company goals. And a lot of it is involved with staffing. Right? And um, when companies are missing the mark significantly, they're forced to realize the fact that staffing and recruiting has changed significantly over the past three years. Absolutely. What I'm seeing is, especially on LinkedIn, is a huge echo chamber of you've got a, a lot of people, recruiting agencies, um, recruitment marketing companies, staffing companies, they're all saying that this is the hardest, absolute craziest market we've ever worked in. You know, candidates are getting two, three offers, you know, and 
I've recruited back in the dot com and then after 9 11 and, you know, a couple years ago. And it is absolutely bonkers right now, right? Candidate ghosting is a major issue. So, you know, what is going on inside that C suite? And you know, do they just not get it or what's going on? Well, and I'm not seeing that typically problems and frustration cause innovation. And they start looking for additional solutions and help, but I'm seeing them push the same buttons as they were in the playbook a year or two, five years ago, right? Yeah. They, they haven't changed. Right. Uh, pain is a part of growth as it relates to almost anything. And uh, at Recruiter Central, a lot of agencies, we have the distinct, I would say, privilege. We get to talk to CEOs all the time. And so we get to hear very specific examples from some of the biggest companies you can imagine. I'm not going to disclose who, who my clients are directly, but you would recognize these as very large name brands. And we have CEOs just kind of speaking candidly about what their struggles are. And across the board, you're going to hear the same themes. Um, you know, I have people, and, and this is coming from C-level individuals, you know, uh, different expectations. You know, I need someone to, you know, put in the work. Uh, work expectations are certainly changing. Tenure is wildly changing. Uh, you know, I, I need someone I can lean on and, and trust for a significant period of time, which has all changed. And um, I think a lot of people are looking at other people to try to figure it out. I don't think anybody has particularly figured it out yet what to do. There's certainly some companies that have done it way better than others. And the theme of the companies that have done it way better than others, they're, they're simply listening to their people and then responding, responding accordingly. It doesn't have to be compensation. It doesn't have to be the craziest package that you can offer. That rarely is the case. People rarely leave for just money. And the companies that are doing it the best without sharing exactly what they're doing, they're listening to their people and they're making adjustments based on what their employees are asking for. I would even say that once they become an employee, right, you're really talking about employee compensation packages or benefits or just general work culture or environment, right? I'm talking about improving the candidate experience. If you can improve your candidate experience, that kind of bodes well for your employee experience, right? If you care enough about treating candidates properly and not ghosting them, um, staffing and resourcing your staffing department or talent acquisition department appropriately, so recruiters aren't working on 50 or 100 jobs and they're not plowing through candidates like fodder, um, it, it makes a huge difference in the candidate experience and what they can expect is you know, becoming an employee and the employee experience. Would you agree? So the can the companies that are doing it well are are the most agile with their with the way that they change things. And so what is antiquated now, what is outdated, what is ancient history is going to be your large, and I'm going to use air quotes here, corporate type interview process. You come on site three or four times. Uh, you interview numerous people. The interview takes two to three weeks. You do an assessment afterwards. You get together and make an executive decision based on the team. It, that's too slow. It, it really is too slow um, for an active candidate in the market. It's still definitely possible, and I would never pr to presume to tell a company what to do, but the companies that are consistently hiring the best talent are, are, are one, putting a lot of attention to recruiting, two, making adjustments, and three, really kind of condensing the interview process to, to really show the candidate what um, you know, the, um, the opportunity will present, and then quickly making a decision after that. So from a talent perspective or from a candidate perspective, what kind of candidates are really getting recruited quickly right now? And you know, being able to land the job of their dreams. Mm -hmm. And so I can give you a specific niche, but I'll take it one step further. The candidates that are be recruiting right now are the ones that have effectively marketed themselves. Hmm. And so what I mean by that, I'm not going to say, you know, your typical well, engineers are really highly recruited after right now our STEM, digital science, technology, math, which is definitely the case. But as you had alluded before, Jeff, um, you know, there's a million recruiters out there sending millions of messages, probably almost daily to a bunch of different candidates. So the key right now in this market is to market yourself effectively. And the ones that have marketed themselves effectively have um, really put attention to their digital self. And so what that means uh, is they've really given some forethought to their digital brand. What do they represent? What skill sets do they bring? 
they've they've taken time to look at what their digital brand is and they've SEO'd it or search engine optimized it. And so what that means is, you know, you're going to show up high in a search string um, on LinkedIn or Google or whoever um, pr pr perspective employers are looking. And some of the easiest ways to do that are, you know, they're loading their profile with relevant keywords or keywords that would be relevant to their next um, employment opportunity. They're posting videos of themselves. They are in the proper community that reflects where they want to go. So for example, if they're an open source engineer, you know, there's going to be, maybe they, you know, are out on, you know, open source repositories like GitHub or Stack Overflow. Maybe there's a video of them speaking at a conference of their latest and greatest technology, or, you know, they're recommended by somebody else, or they're, they're easily searched uh, by a recruiter like us using keywords to find the next talent. And so I would say individuals who have marketed themselves effectively are the ones that are, are getting all the looks right now. And I would kind of reiterate to, especially the candidates that are, they, if they're having a difficult time finding a job right now, they are not marketing themselves properly. They probably need to rewrite their resume, definitely need to rewrite their LinkedIn profile. And what they most likely do not understand is that Google is the largest search engine in the, in the world, but LinkedIn is the largest candidate search engine in the world for recruiters. 90% of recruiters that are using LinkedIn start their search on LinkedIn. They don't go to their own database. They don't go through candidates that have already applied for whatever reason. They start their research on LinkedIn. It's crazy, um, but they don't go through their own database. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. um, they've got an applicant tracking system. They've got candidate relationship management tools, but yet they would prefer to start out on LinkedIn which is why LinkedIn is so valuable to recruiters right now. Yeah, there's the whole dopamine thing of uh, finding a new external candidate for the first time, uh, definitely on, on that. But I want to take it back in terms of, um, you know, marketing yourself. And so often candidates ask me, well, what do you think of my resume? What do you think of my resume? Well, unless I'm actually hiring them, you know, it, it doesn't really matter so much what I think. It matters what the employer thinks, the person hiring you. And so what I would tell someone who is looking for maybe a dream job or a job is, you know, shape what you're saying to fit the way they say it. And so an easy way to do that is look at those job descriptions. That would be your next ideal role. You know, is there certain technologies that they're using or skill sets or certifications that maybe you have or are working towards? You know, when you think about how we find you, recruiters use a set of keywords based on the job description. So we'll use two or three keywords at, at most sometimes to find you and either you have them or you don't. Now, you always want to be truthful and honest, but a lot of times you may have a certain experience that you're just omitting uh, on your profile that you've done. And so recruiter speak per se, isn't some crazy fluid sentence or paragraph. Usually recruiters speak, speak by finding candidates with two or three words and um, either you have them or not a keyword search is what we use. And so if you want to be found, maximize your chances of being found by expanding the amount of targeted keywords that you have associated with your digital profile. An easy way to do that is look up a bunch of job descriptions on any of the job boards yes. and find out some of the keywords and phrases that are being used across a multiple of companies. And then Take those keywords and phrases and put them into your LinkedIn profile. Put them into your resume, right? Mm -hmm. It should be a text-based resume. PDF is okay. Word doc is okay. Don't take an image of it. It's not going to get, um, nobody wants to do optical character recognition on your resume these days, right? So PDF it and don't make it very fancy. Um, applicant tracking systems are going to uh, scrape out all that stuff anyway. They'll store the PDF as a Word doc but most times they're gonna turn it into an RTF or a text document anyway, and they parse it or they take all that information and they put it into specific fields. Um, they'll take your uh, number of years experience in Java and they'll try and figure out how many years you got in that. They'll take your first name and put it in the first name field, stuff like that. So it's called structured data versus unstructured data. Structured data is a lot easier to search and it's faster. So that's why companies like putting that data out there. Just little mm -hmm. quick tips there. So the majority of recruiters are using structured data to find yeah. you as a candidate. Let's be honest, the vast majority of, of them are. And that's what makes doing Boolean search or keyword search terms so difficult because that is really good for unstructured data. 
and resumes are very unstructured data, right? You just, it's just a hug pile of a ton of words and keywords thrown together on a page. So recruiters have to decipher all of that. And when you have 20 or 30 recs on your desk and you got, um, you know, 50 to 100 candidates per requisition and you have to fill as many roles as you can every month, you're not going to spend a whole lot of time reading resumes. I can tell you that right now. Uh, average average time is seven to 10 seconds, right? Yeah, so. 10, 10 seconds would be generous yep. um, for recruiters that have been doing it for a while, let's be honest, you know, it's yep. a glance. So we are relying upon those search engine keywords to pull up the right resumes to begin with, right? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. all right, so let's get into some of the, the, the nitty gritty, the fun stuff here. Um, I've been in recruitment marketing now for 20, 25 years. You've been recruiting for, I don't know, 10, 15 years. If you've got a difficult to fill requisition and your company kind of specializes in DTF or purple squirrel stuff, right? You got a difficult to fill requisition, jobs been open for, let's say, 60 days. What the heck should a company be doing? So as a recruiting leader, um, either if you're the, the recruiting manager or the recruiter, um, you know, the first thing you have to do is be respectful of your time as well and respect yourself. And you have to do that by really understanding what the problem is. When a job has been open for 30, 60, especially 90 days, that tells you a lot. There's something wrong. And rarely, I'm going to say rarely, is it a candidate flow issue. If a role has been open for 90 days, something's wrong. Um, and it could be a number of things. But us as recruiters, we are a sector of HR. And so we a lot of times need to put our HR hat on and really dig in and understand, you know, why has the role been open for 90 days? We'll use as an example. And so, you know, it starts with understanding, you know, listen to what the manager says, but oftentimes a manager, just because the manager is telling you something that doesn't necessarily the end all be all, uh, often get, you know, different perspective, talk to HR, understand, you know, why is this role open? You know, how is the manager doing? Let's look at comp data in the markets, um, understand what the employer branding represent, the reputation is. Really understand all the different factors that go into why someone would either accept or decline a job. The biggest thing that we want to avoid as, as recruiters is to be yes people. Um, the role is probably open for 60 to 90 days because yes, people were working on it. And that was the problem in the beginning. So we need to find what the it is before we get going. And that really kind of moves the needle from tactical recruiting to strategic recruiting is being an order taker to really understanding what is the true need of the business and being able to identify why the role is open so long. And then once you've identified why the role is uh, open so so long, you know, using data and market information to influence various leaders to make adjustments. You know, it could be something as simple as the job posting. Uh, it could be something more complex as an organizational or employment branding issue, which is a lot more difficult to overcome. But uh, those are the things that you want to definitely keep in mind when you approach a job that's been open for a certain period of time. That should be one of the very first questions you ask if you're new to a rec uh, or, or taking on something for the first time. You know, how long has it been open? Why is it open? And a very senior recruiter, should be able to identify what the problem is and then prescribe a solution to fix that problem. Mm -hmm. If you've got a hiring manager that doesn't really know what they're looking for as far as minimum skill set requirements, and they just pulled, let's say, a templated job description out of the uh, applicant tracking system and use that five years this, three years that, two years this, and they don't really know what they're looking for in a perfect candidate, right? And then your solution as a recruiter is to drive a bunch of candidates into the top of the funnel. Well, dollars to donuts, that's not going to solve the problem. In fact, it's probably going to exacerbate the problem. Yes. So you, you need to go back to the hiring manager and figure out what those minimum skill set requirements are. And I'm not talking from a five-year this, three years at what college degree. You really need to hammer down, what are you looking for? What is this person going to be doing on a day-to-day -day basis? And what are the strategic outcomes for your organization, your department that you're looking to resolve, right? Or get solved. Mm -hmm. um, why does this person need to be hired in the first place? You got to justify it to the recruiter. A lot of hiring managers don't like doing that. It's oh, nor able. They should yeah. be able to be be able to preach on the top of the roof about how great their role is or why it's important to the organization or be able to speak to all the things you got to ask them that right away and understand, you know, do you want this person to be in the front 
person to do all the recruiting, or maybe recruiting isn't their skill set, and we need to talk about a different strategy to bring this person on board. But yeah, you sell me on this job at first. You know, how do you possibly expect to hire a top candidate if you in no way can articulate why this role is something for me? Yeah. I had a, a hiring manager I was talking to one time and I say, hey, why would a candidate want to come work here? And he's like, honestly, we wouldn't. This is a horrible place. No. <laughs> it's a horrible job. It's warehouse work. You're working 12 hours a day on your feet. Your feet are killing you at the end of the day. I'm like, you're not giving me a whole lot here to sell. <laughs> you got to sell and tell the opportunity, right? Yeah. And there uh, is jobs like that. Let's be honest. Yeah. There is. But as an ethical recruiter, um, you know, that could still be an opportunity for the right person. Uh, we just need to level set and understand that. Um, you know, if it is what it is, it is what it is. And so hey, um, I know tons of people that can't stand sitting behind a desk. No. They can't stand working on their phone or a computer all day. And they need to be up and around and moving. That's, yeah. they cannot stand sitting at a desk. So being a recruiter is like being a slug. You just sit in the desk, sit and sit, sit there and pound and grind, grind away on the yes. phone all day long, right? part of what we do. Mm -hmm. Click and clack away on the computer. So let's say you've got the job open. Obviously there's, there's different strategies. If the job's been open for 60 days versus 90 days versus six months, right? There are different strategies that a uh, recruiting firm like yourself would deploy or employ um, to make sure that, A, you've got the right skill sets, the hiring managers knows what they're looking for. But let's say you've got all that hammered down, you're four to five months into this, you're still not getting a candidate pipeline that's kind of worthwhile. Um, and candidates are just trickling in one or two at a time. There's not a whole lot of candidates, right? So. What are some of the strategies that a recruiting firm or um, a talent acquisition department should start looking at? So when I was a recruiting leader at Target and Cargill, um, we would always do surveys to hiring managers and we'd ask them for feedback on recruiters. And commonly, the biggest feedback we would get from hiring managers is, you know, I don't know what you were doing. You know, what were you doing all week? What, you know, are you working on my job? I'm like, I haven't heard from yeah. you. Like, what's going on? All that so, stuff takes place behind the curtain, right? You yes, <laughs> yes, but they don't know. I mean, yeah. we're not communicating that to them. And that's fair That's fair criticism, and you listen. And so uh, one of the things that I think is so important to show that you are a strategic add-on versus just passing resumes on is, is the communication piece. More specifically, you know, we have access to so much information in the market. We talk to people all the time. We have great tools. Uh, so one of the ways that we do it at Recruiter Central is, uh, you know, every Friday we update the hiring manager. You know, here's a list of 20 candidates that we have spoken to. Here are the target 20 companies and I, the number can, you know, vary, but, you know, here's our target companies. Here's the people that we've talked to. Uh, here's what they're saying. And then here is kind of a breakdown of what we're hearing. Um, here is why we're not presenting candidates. It, it, you can look at it as an insurance policy, but you need to use the data to understand why are we not presenting candidates? You know, we're talking to them, they're responding, this is what's going on. Uh, and, and that data really helps in, in, in our case to help move the needle with the hiring manager. So let's say three weeks go by and we say, you know, Mrs. Hiring Manager, Miss Hiring Manager, Mr. Hiring Manager, you know, we, you know, we've spoken to these 30 people. Um, you know, here are their profiles. You will agree that this is exactly the skill set that we're looking for. Will you not? That's what they're saying. You're below comp. You know, I don't want to drive there. You need to be remote. Whatever theme it is, um, you're giving them actionable items and real-time data in the market to help drive the decision, uh, the hiring decision of where it needs to be. So you use that data, you have that conversation with the hiring manager, you say, okay, we need to make a change after three or four weeks. Um, I'm consistently hearing this, you know, let's say it's compensation. You know, that's when you loop in HR and say, well, we need to, you know, make a few adjustments or we need to offer something else. It's really hard for a hiring manager to look at all the data and say, no, um, you know, they definitely do say no once in a while, but if you're able to present the data in a very objective way, uh, you're able to make the case as to why the role is not open. And then you're able to show the adjustment that needs to be made from the business. Uh, you make that adjustment and then you go. I mean, if you've been sourcing for three weeks and you don't have one or two viable candidates, it's time to call a timeout and, and demonstrate uh, the data that you've created up to that point. Absolutely. So this is kind of 
recruiting 101 market intelligence, right? Um, you, you touched on a couple of points. A, you need to be making sure that you're going after the right target companies. If you are a software as a service company, specifically in the cybersecurity space, um, and you cannot hire candidates out of any other space or you don't have an interest in it, then pulling people out of, let's say, financial is not going to work. Pulling people out of, you know, um, market, market intelligence, you know, or marketing software isn't going to work. You need cybersecurity software. Okay. Now you've got a list of target companies that are software as a service, cybersecurity firms. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're trying to hire a specific skill set out of there, you need to identify who they are in those target companies. A lot of recruiters, they, they're just spitballing and they're shotgunning approach. They're, they're posting their jobs in the wrong places. They're not putting the messaging on there, they're going to attract the right candidates. And most importantly, when they go out and search for candidates, they're not searching at the right target companies to begin with. Now, you might be able to pull a candidate that used to work at XYZ cybersecurity firm. That's fine. They have that background. But if you need somebody that's currently doing it, then you need to go after the target companies, right? It's competitive target analysis. That's basic recruiting 101. Once you identify those target companies, you identify your list of candidates from those target companies. Don't be spitballing all over the place. Hit those target, be a sniper. Hit the 10 or 15 candidates at that company. And then you develop a strategy to start messaging and reaching out to those 10 or 15 candidates at every one of those target companies, mm -hmm. right? It's, mm -hmm. it's not rocket science, but it does take a lot of research, right? It does. Um, and that's just, that's how I did sourcing. And that's how I ran my sourcing teams. You need to have your market intelligence nailed down first. The next thing that I would recommend is, you know, your messaging. If you're just going to throw a text-based job description over the fence and hope that a passive candidate is going to apply to your job, it's probably not the best, right? <laughs> it's not a very good candidate experience. So, from a candidate experience, when you're doing initial candidate reach out, um, let's say the job's been open for 60, 90 days, do you change up your messaging? Do you change up your uh, methodology on how you're reaching out to candidates? Well, yeah, you absolutely do. And I think one of the things that we've seen evolved is kind of a, and I've used this term before, so a recruiter central, a recruiter specific model, you know, the recruiter is the front of the company, you know, they're the ones messaging, they're the ones putting out the job posting. What we've definitely seen change during, you know, over the past few years is kind of a leader centric or hiring manager centric approach. And that is, you know, they're the ones that is going to be doing the hiring. So leverage them. So what that could look like, especially in the engineering space is the manager is the job description. So the manager or a technical technology leader, somebody is out speaking. They're out posting the job on wherever they're at. They are putting their message in a target community. They're in a video, an employment branding video. You know, they're posting how great it is to work, you know, at their company on their LinkedIn profile. Their messaging has changed away from this is a job description and take this job to, you know, here's what it's like to work at with me, you know, here's the great technology that you're learning. And they're not really even talking about the job per se. They're more talking about the, the, uh, the, the company, uh, you know, the services and goods that, that they provide by working there and the good things that'll come being there. And that's kind of some things that we've seen go on hyperdrive uh, during this time is the evolution of um, what a job posting actually looks like. You know, one of the things that we're doing inside my recruitment marketing agency is we actually get on a Zoom with the hiring manager and we give them a script to read. And the script is something like, hey, my name is so-and-so. I'm the hiring manager for you know, the sales department. I'm the VP of sales, whatever. And we're hiring for a, a couple of account executive positions in Seattle, Washington. Um, I asked my recruiting team to reach out to you in confidence about a specific opportunity on my team. And I'd love for you to schedule a time with them to see if there's any interest in this position. Having that come from that hiring manager in video and not from a recruiter, our, our response rates are like 80% off of that. It's amazing, right? So even if the candidate responds back, hey, not interested, at least the recruiter knows 
right? They've got some kind of response back for the candidate. One of the biggest problems that we're seeing across the board is candidates just are not responsive as much as they used to be. No, why would they? I mean, they're getting yeah. bombarded with messages and I got you know, a job. <laughs> they got a job and it's white noise and they have to focus on what they have to focus on. Yep. So that you know what you just, just kind of describe as a, a leader centric or hiring manager centric recruiting strategy. And frankly, that means a lot more to them than anything a recruiter would say. You know, they're not a technologist, they're not an accountant, they're not a you know, whatever, they're not working with that person every day. It means a lot more coming from them. And so as a recruiter, yes, we're still, you know, doing what we normally do, but the companies that have done it well, they find a couple of people who have maybe have that baked into their KPIs or their overall performance is recruiting. And, you know, they're championing, championing what they're doing. Um, you know, they're supporting them. They're giving them tools and training. They're giving them the messages. They're giving them the list of candidates to reach out to. So they're really leveraging them versus as the front person versus the recruiter being the face of the yeah. company. And I'm seeing a lot of hiring managers are interested in doing that. But on the flip side, I'm not seeing enough hiring managers doing it, right? Um, so getting those hiring managers involved early on and not when it becomes critical, right? Because now you've got a dissatisfied hiring manager. You want to get them hiring or involved in the hiring process a lot earlier. And don't let it go to a critical state. When we're talking to our clients, we say, look, we're going to work this for one or two weeks, um, but most likely we've been working on these types of jobs for a long time now. We would recommend that we start recording videos before the job is even opened, right? Mm -hmm. At the very, at the latest, you should do it one or two weeks after the job is open. If you don't have good candidate flow, you escalate to video, you escalate to additional job board postings. You, would, you have to initiate your tier two recruiting and sourcing strategy. Um, if it goes another two weeks, you go to a tier three um, escalation, right? So we had a tiered strategy and you start off with the lowest hanging fruit and then you work through two weeks, boom, another two weeks, you work on the next branch or the next level of the tree, the next two weeks, three weeks, you go up the tree, right? Um, you know, don't start from the top down. It's not mm -hmm. going to, it's not going to be very good for you if you don't do that, but get the hiring manager involved. That's what I highly recommend. So any other uh, yeah, last hiring thing? manager piece, Jeff, though, but make sure your hiring manager is a marketable person and that's their skill set. So, you know, it may be the hiring manager. And one of the things I would say is, you know, look at them the way a candidate would look at them. So Google them, you know, have they spoken? Are they, you know, are they a good representation of the employment brand? Uh, are they good at recruiting? Um, are they good at attracting people? Uh, you know, make sure you have those things figured out. And it doesn't have to be the hiring manager. I, I've worked a lot of times with individual contributors who, you know, are very, like in engineering, for example, you know, they're very good coders and they've spoken at conferences and they're known as a subject matter expert in that space. Maybe they're better off leveraged as kind of the front point person to use as, you know, this is a person you're working with versus the hiring manager, you know, do a little audit of, you know, you know, of the person that you're going to have out front, you know, the hiring manager, maybe they don't even have a profile or no social uh, footprint, or maybe they're not as good of an interviewer or speaker, you know, you might want to maybe consider putting someone else on the front in that, in that strategy. So there's, there's a couple schools of thought. It depends on what you're, how you're doing it. Um, from an employer branding standpoint, um, very top of funnel, I would say, yes, you absolutely want to get people that are energetic and dynamic and, you know, people that are good on video or good, however, whatever your medium is, right? However, when you're doing very targeted recruitment marketing strategies, um, I would recommend you have to let the hiring manager be who it is they are, right? Yeah. Let them be, right? And because birds of a feather flock together. And if you have a very introverted hiring manager and they don't work well with people that are extroverted, having somebody attract extroverted people to the, the group where the hiring manager isn't going to jive with them, it's not going to work, right? I've worked with a lot of like engineering hiring managers that um, they know how to code backwards, upwards, left and down and right, but they can't hold a conversation if they had a bag, right? But get them in front of a hiring manager, they can show the passion that they have about 
you know, the project and whatever else, right? They're just not good face to face. So um, I would play to the strengths of that hiring manager. Yeah, I think that's, that's better said. Yep. So any uh, last thoughts here? Uh, so it goes by quick, doesn't it? We're in 45 minutes already. 40 minutes. It, it does. If, if you're a recruiter, this is kind of the, um, the feast time of recruiting. Uh, recruiting comes and goes and uh, ups and downs. And this is kind of a, a crazy time to be in recruiting. Uh, as a hiring manager, um, this is kind of a challenging time to find that best, uh, best scenario candidate. Uh, things always change and the companies and recruiters that are doing well are the ones that are listening the best to the market and most able to change based on those market conditions. A question just came to me, which you might be able to answer, right? So besides being flexible on um, either skill sets or compensation, which are probably the two biggest flexes that hiring managers have to be flexible on. Mm -hmm. um, where else can hiring managers be flexible? No. So I guess the best recruiters and hiring managers that uh, I know personally, you know, they, they talk very little, unlike me talking the whole time. It's really understanding the why of the candidate. You know, why are you talking to me? Why are you looking? What prompted you to take my call? And so, um, you know, that's definitely a, a, the why question is um, so very important when interviewing and then leveraging that. And, you know, if, if you can leverage that, great. And if you can't, say you can't. Uh, so, you know, that would be one thing that I would definitely tell is kind of my secret trick as a recruiter is talk less, listen more and find what that it is or the why is. And that's where you spend your time. How about from a hiring manager's perspective? How would you consult with a hiring manager and make recommendations to them on how they could be more flexible. Yeah. So um, I guess what I talked about before is coming to coming prepared in, in terms of market data, understanding all the, the background, why it's been open, how long it's been open, any sort of information you can bring and come to the table with that information ready versus just simply an order taker. So to answer your question about what hiring managers can do, um, listen to the, fi find the best recruiter that you can and listen to them, consult from them. They're going to be able to, you know, they're in the market every day swimming around. So my philosophy in life is find someone who's doing it better than you. And then that's who you listen to as a hiring manager, find, find somebody who's doing it better than you find the best recruiter you can and, and listen before you, you know, you begin that recruiting journey. Imagine that take advice from the recruiter. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, recruiters are experts at recruiting, right? Most hiring managers are not experts at recruiting. They're not talking to, you know, 50 or 100 candidates every single week, right? right. Um, so, and I don't expect my hiring managers to be experts at recording video or editing video or even talking or interviewing candidates. So I coach them along with that. When I'm recording a video with them, I tell them, hey, you got to look at the camera. You have to enunciate your words. You have to have really good lighting. You have to, you know, et cetera. Lights, camera, action kind of stuff, right? And it's the same thing when I'm talking to them about interviewing. When you're talking to candidates, you have to understand what you're looking for and why this candidate wants to work here mm -hmm. and why you want them to work here. It's as easy as that. <laughs> yeah, you get to those three questions and you can usually make a match. Especially with the generations going on right now, uh, it's it's not about me as the recruiter or you as the recruiter or the hiring manager. Uh, very few candidates want to sit there and hear how great the manager is or, or yeah. want to hear how smart the recruiter is. You know, we're here to listen and and we're here to to answer your questions. And so, one of the biggest red flags in recruiting is a recruiter who makes the process about themselves. It's not about me. It's about finding the right person for this particular role. Awesome. Luke, thank you so much for being on the 10 x Experience Show. Where can people find you? Uh, you could find me in a number of places. Our company is recruitercentral.io, and you can find me on LinkedIn. My name is Luke Doubler, and my company is Recruiter Central. And I'll put all those links in the description, everybody. So if you have any questions on how to find Luke and get in touch with him, you certainly can do it right in the description. All right, Luke, make it a great day, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.